Good morning, everyone. Um, it does seem strange to say good morning since it is very much uh, still Thursday night here uh, coming from Phoenix, Arizona in the United States. My name is Scott Edwards. I'm a professor of orthopedic surgery and the director of the Hand, Upper Extremity and Microsurgery Fellowship here. Uh, we have a number of Europeans that come through and visit us. Um, I encourage you to do so through the IBRA Foundation. Uh, but in any case, I'd like to talk to you today about a topic that's near and dear to my heart and a topic that may be familiar to some of you, but may be unfamiliar to many of you. Um, and that is the topic of spanning plates, uh, particularly for distal radius fractures. I'm gonna talk about what it is, why we do it, and uh, really how it's done and some of the new uh, indications for it. So with that said, spanning plates, uh, I just want to uh, explain that it comes uh, a lot of different names. Uh, it's sometimes called bridge plating, uh, distraction plating, or even the internal X fix. And all these things are terms that mean the exact same thing. It's the same concept. Uh, there is not a variation between these things. It's the same thing. So the concept itself is actually very simple. You have a distal radius fracture. And the idea is to, through small incisions, proximal and distal to the fracture, slide a plate under the skin, under the tendons, along the bone, maintaining the soft tissue envelope around the distal radius and thereby stabilizing the fracture. So that's basically what it is. Now let's dive a little bit deeper. This is a technique that's not new, at least in North America, uh, and to some extent, South America, but at least talking to my colleagues in Europe, really uh, relatively unheard of. Uh, and so I'm happy to introduce this to you. It's well established in our literature, both from a clinical standpoint and a biomechanical standpoint. And so um, it initially began with, um, as a result of a, situation dealing with high energy injuries to the distal radius, these highly comminuted intraarticular fractures, sometimes open, a lot of soft tissue injury. Well, um, you know, usually these were fixed with external fixation. Um, and I think a lot of you still would address this fracture perhaps the same way. But as we know, external fixation does have a very high complication rate. It's actually been reported up to 70% and I think that number is a little high, uh, depending on what you define to be a, a complication, but it nevertheless, uh, certainly the satisfaction rates, at least in patients that I deal with, do not like it, um, even if you avoid the complications. But certainly you do see iatrogenic fractures, particularly the second metacarpal where that pin is placed. You also see superficial radial nerve injuries, uh, proximally, uh, where the proximal pins go. Pin track infections, of course, can happen. There can be malposition problems resulting in carpal tunnel syndrome or perhaps complex regional pain syndrome. And you can also have over distraction of the joint and this leads to stiffness and orthofibrosis of the joint as well as non-unions. So basically XFIX has developed a very bad name uh, in the United States. And so we are constantly looking for something to replace it and something perhaps better. And so that's the advent of replacing the X fix with a spanning plate, which essentially did the same thing and hopefully avoided many of these complications. So the advantage of a spanning plate, at least on the surface, is that it does eliminate obviously the pin track infections because there's no pin sticking out of the skin. Uh, and frankly, uh, tolerated a little bit better by patients. There's also, um, a buttressing dorsally of any kind of fractures that may be happening there that external fixation can't do. And also because the moment arms are shorter, mechanically there's less distraction required. That means you don't have to pull on the joint as hard and therefore better digital motion, less risk of complex regional pain syndrome as a result of that. The construct itself is much more stable and durable than an external fixator and mechanically much stronger than an X-fix to the point where you can allow for early load bearing. And that was one of the early advantages of this uh, technique that if you had somebody you had to span, instead of putting an X fix on it, a, a spanning plate would allow these polytrauma patients that need to use their arms to weight bear 
um, uh, to mobilize a little bit easier. Also, uh, elderly that use cane or walkers can also get up uh, and use their hands if they need to. Now, the indications for uh, spanning plates uh, initially was these intraarticular fractures extending to the metadiaphysis. Now, also, these highly commuted intraarticular fractures, there were obvious indications to replace the X fix for this. But now the indications seem to be broadening, at least in, in our minds in North America, to include the osteoporotic bone where we can neutralize the forces uh, with the spanning um, technique. Far distal fractures, the type of fractures you see in the elderly where the, um, uh, that are difficult to control with any kind of fragment specific fixation. Also radiocarpal fracture dislocations, also sometimes difficult to uh, manage and control. Polytrauma patients we've already talked about that need to ambulate with their upper extremities. Also bilateral distal radius fractures where you need to get in, get out quickly. They need to weight bear. They need to do something with their hands and they don't have the luxury of uh, favoring one side or the other. Distal radius non-unions are also an indication if you suspect the bone will take a physiologically very long time to heal. And also Keenbox disease. And this has been a really recent uh, new indication that we can talk about a little bit later. But essentially there are two types of techniques for spanning. Where are you gonna put these plates? You can either span to the third metacarpal, which was the original technique, or the second metacarpal, which was a variation. And each uh, has its advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the third metacarpal has the obvious problem of EPL impingement. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later in more detail. The second metacarpal span uh, puts the radial sensory nerve at risk um, with making that incision there. And that can certainly uh, happen as well. So most surgeons, even in North America, if you were to give them the choice between the third and the second metacarpal may choose one or the other, depending on which complication they would like to, to uh, deal with. But the reality is that it's really not surgeon preference. It's really dictated by the type of fractures you want to fix. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in detail here now. So this is an important slide in that I want you to remember that I think you should choose the technique to span, not based on your just what, you, uh, what your preference would be, but because the fracture dictates it. In other words, if your problem in this fracture seems to be mostly at the radial column, then I would recommend spanning to the second metacarpal because the plate, which is the most powerful thing you're gonna be putting in that wrist, is going to be addressing that radial column directly and everything else indirectly. Now, if most of the trouble of that distal radius is in the intermediate column, the lunate facet, uh, et cetera, then perhaps consider spanning to the third metacarpal because the power is gonna be right in that area. Everything else can, if it doesn't correct with simple ligamentotaxis, uh, then you can use supplemental fixation, either pins, uh, small fragment specific plates, anything you can think of, screws, suture anchors, um, that can also, also supplement what's going on to the lesser part of the fracture. And we'll talk about, uh, give you some examples of these in a moment. Here is an 89 year old female fell from the bed. We think uh, this happened about four weeks ago. She was in an assisted living facility. Uh, apparently this got neglected. So at this point we have very soft bone. Uh, it's a very distal fragment uh, fracture pattern, uh, very comminuted, intraarticular, very difficult to control. And now it's also four weeks old. Uh, so the bone is even softer. It's gonna be harder to mobilize. And as you do mobilize it, it can fragment even more. So this seemed like a good indication in my mind not to do fragment specific fixation and have things just kind of crumble or fall apart in my hands, but rather span it. And that's what we did here. Um, the correction now, obviously she's four weeks out now. We use some supplemental fixation for the pins on the radial side um, without, we easily could have used a radial uh, plate as well, uh, but we decided to keep it minimally invasive. Um, uh, because of the soft tissue envelope around the bone. Now, you'll notice that the radius is not quite out to the height I would like, so the correction is not there. We could have done that had we really pushed on the plate to pull it out. Um, uh, 
the the risk of that though is that the uh, joint surface, the excuse me, the joint interval here cannot be over distracted more than five millimeters. If that happens, then essentially you're doing the same problem that we have external fixation with over distraction. You're going to have a very tight wrist, uh, very difficult moving the fingers while the plate's in place. And so this is about as far as I could uh, correct this without starting to over distract the joint. Um, the plate was removed. Uh, I think the, you know, the fragments uh, stayed in, in good alignment. Uh, as I said, the radial height could have been better, but um, right now I don't think I could have done better with fragment specific fixation, to be honest. So if we look at the literature, what does it say about commutative interarticular fractures? Uh, here's a study that came out uh, back uh, five years ago and looked at 18 patients. Um, with you know, intraarticular commutative fractures. And I, the thing I wanna point out here is that the results, even taking the plate out three months later, uh, had very good results. In fact, um, the range of motion was comparable, I would say, to fragment-specific fixation, at least in my hands. So um, uh, that was very interesting that even though you're keeping the joint immobilized for that long, the plate comes out and then you still can uh, expect this kind of range of motion and function. Here is a uh, case by uh, Greg Rafasia, who uh, sent this to me and I give him credit for this. Uh, he's dealing with a uh, radiocarpal dislocation and somebody who also had carpal tunnel symptoms from a motor vehicle accident. After the reduction, the carpal tunnel symptoms went away. You can see a little clearly that there is a, uh, a styloid fragment here in addition to an unstable carpus. And, uh, and, and there's certainly different ways to fix this, but he decided to span it uh, fix the uh, radial styloid with pins and use some suture anchors for the capsule to repair, as well as a carpal tunnel syndrome. Now he spanned to the second metacarpal because that was his preference and he felt like that was uh, um, all that was uh, needed. He didn't need to go to the third. Um, and uh, he's telling us that he has, the patient has full finger motion and he plans to remove this plate in about four weeks. So a situation like this, you can remove the plate a lot earlier than say osteoporotic comminuted bone where you have to keep it a little bit longer for longer prolonged healing. And what does the literature say about radiocarpal fracture dislocations? Well, in this series, they had 13 patients uh, with a similar kind of uh, radiocarpal dislocation. And again, the range of motion was very good, about as good as any other uh, technique that I've seen uh, to fix these. Here's a 75 year old female who fell. And this time we have uh, quite a bit of uh, fragment uh, uh, displacement to deal with. We have things dorsally, we have things volarly, we have a radial styloid, which is very high up. Uh, and I think this would be very hard to control with, uh, with any technique, but I think you'd have to certainly um, uh, resort to fragment specific fixation all around this uh, radius. And we kind of did that. We did some uh, a spanning plate. I thought most of the work needed to be in that intermediate column. So I spanned to the third metacarpal. And I also used fragment specific fixation for the problem areas I needed to that the plate did not address. Here's an 81 year old female fell. Uh, again, we have a very soft bone here. We have a very distal fragments uh, that are difficult to control. Uh, very comminuted articular surface. And, um, and in this case, I felt the, uh, I'm going to go back real quick. Um, most of my concern was this radial column here controlling this. And so that's why I decided to span to the second metacarpal. And uh, this helped the problem. I also used some fragment specific fixation for some other issues. Now, one of two things are going to happen. You know, you, 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 you plan on removing the plate at the time of healing. But if you leave it in too long, one of two things are going to happen. Either the plate is going to break at the joint uh, or it's going to pull away from the bone. And in this case, the bone was so soft, even in the metacarpal shaft, that the patient with rehabilitation and just normal use um, just pulled away from it. Now, thank goodness, at this point, the distal radius had healed and she did not lose her reduction. And all we had to do was to remove the rest of the plate and, uh, and she went on to a very good result. So what about these fragility fractures in the elderly? Uh, again, 
a spanning plate was used for these things and 100% union, which you like to see in the older population. And um, again, the, the uh, range of motion, the function, as good as anything I've seen from internal fixation, despite keeping the plate in and usually uh, up to about three months. Now, there are some problems um, with the plates currently on the market. There are design problems that uh, MedArtis in particular has aggressively gone after. And part of the problem is that usually these plates are just straight plates. You get them out of any kind of trauma set um, and they are just perfectly straight. That puts the wrist in a perfectly straight position. Now, as you know, uh, the stronger grip has a little bit of wrist extension. The weaker grip, your grip weakens as you lose that extension and come out straight. And essentially what we're seeing right here is a straight plate. So this has two things going on. If you uh, have a straight uh, wrist, functionally while the plate's in, you're not gonna be as functional as you could be. Um, but more importantly, if you do get a little stiff, you get stiff in this position. And that's not a very advantageous uh, kind of position. So what is the ideal position for, in this case, a fusion, and this can apply to uh, spanning plates, is that it has been you know, documented by several authors that the maximal grip strength and endurance seem to be somewhere between 25 and 45 degrees. Now, straight plates, as we said, less functional, weaker grip, post-op stiffness, and here's a patient that um, had the plate uh, removed at, I think, an appropriate time on the right, on his right side, but four months after the plate came out, even after rehabilitation, he's still pretty stiff. So this wasn't as, uh, as happy as I'd like him to be. Uh, and I wonder if he had started with a little bit of extension, would he be uh, a little happier? Uh, because some people are just gonna get stiff no matter what you do. So MedArtist felt a good compromise because you know 25 to 45 degrees is a little bit extreme uh, for most people. So. An 18 degree sagittal bend seems to be a good compromise between strength, function, cosmetic appeal, and patient satisfaction. So that's what their two plates are uh, designed to be. Now, the second problem is even more interesting. This is an alignment problem. Um, it was originally described that this plate would then pass from the radius underneath the fourth dorsal compartment to the third metacarpal. Now, the problem with that uh, despite doing it for 10 years, is that nobody seemed to realize that the third uh, metacarpal and the fourth dorsal compartment does not really line up with the axis of the radius. And that's what's happening. Inevitably, this plate has to jump over Lister's tubercle to get to the fourth dorsal compartment and then to the third metacarpal. And doing so puts the EPL at risk. So this alignment issue also makes the plate difficult to advance as you're having to go around bone and between different compartments and it's uh, fairly traumatic uh, to pass this sometimes. Uh, you can displace the dorsal fragments inadvertently. Uh, you could result in eccentric drilling of the metacarpal and that could lead to an insufficiency fracture. You also can have um, possible tendon entrapments uh, by passing over that uh, third compartment. So MedArtis came out with something called the Sidewinder, and this is nicknamed because, I don't know if many of you know this, but there is a, a, a rattlesnake that's indigenous to uh, my area of the country uh, around the desert climates uh, that has a very unusual uh, pattern of mobilization as it kind of winds around. And so, um, uh, playing off this, uh, we kind of nicknamed it the Sidewinder. And the reason why we do this is because it um, uh, curves around the problem area. And I have a video to show you what's happening exactly and how we pass this plate. So I'm going to try to narrate this as we go. So uh, there's the Lister's tubercle. Here's EPL running around here. Here is the third metacarpal the second metacarpal, and the plates of yesteryear just jumped over Lister's tubercle as it made its, uh, excuse me, this one passes to the second metacarpal very easily. However, the third metacarpal doesn't align very well, and as it runs, here's the fourth dorsal compartment running from the third metacarpal, 
but then it falls off the radius. So if you have a plate, oh, did I just stop this? There it goes. If I have a plate that's passing along here, I have to jump over Lister's tubercle and you can see how I'm just lying right over EPL. And that's why this is a potential complication of this technique. MedArt has solved this problem by creating a plate that avoids this problem. So now what happens is it sits on the third metacarpal, runs around uh, Lister's tubercle, does not get involved with EPL at all, and then finds the axis of the radius appropriately. So here's how it gets passed. So you run right along uh, the metacarpal and it just very easy passing right to the fourth dorsal compartment here. But then you have to turn it. So right here, it's very easy. And then we turn when it gets to that point for the axis of the radius. You feel a little bit of resistance here because you're actually pulling against some of the muscles and the tendons. You're sliding it along the bone. And then it'll suddenly give very easily as the curvature of the carpus settles down right there. So there's a little pop and it tells you exactly where to leave it. Now, I overshot this a little bit because the proximal portion of the plate is a little bit more radial. That just needs a minor adjustment in and out. And then you're gonna see it lies perfectly right where it should be right there. I think that's the end of the video really. So now, now we're just uh, made two small incisions uh, to fix the plate to the metacarpal, fix it to the radius. The next problem is a plate size problem. So it's been shown that um, these three five plates that have been used originally were very strong, but they're very bulky. Uh, they are particularly difficult to pass. Uh, the screws are really too big for the metacarpal, therefore increasing the risk of fracture. And this led to some tendon irritation and um, made it very difficult to flex the MP joint. But you can, you can see, uh, a big three, five plate so close to the joint here, the tendons have to arch around uh, this area, making it very difficult. The two four plates, uh, which are much lower profile, but they break. Uh, they just don't have the durability. In fact, uh, Jerry Huang at the University of uh, Washington in Seattle showed in a study that uh, they're actually less stable than the volar plates. They actually failed uh, before the volar plates failed. Um, so, so this was... Um, uh, and even then still difficult to pass because of the, uh, uh, the limitations of the straight plate. So what we know about the fourth dorsal compartment at the radius is that it has a, uh, a geography of eight by 20 millimeters. Anything bigger than that won't fit or is gonna jeopardize uh, the tendons or cramp the tendons too much or possibly even go over the tendons. Uh, and so we have to keep it under that dimension. There are some uh, spanning plate designs out there that are completely misguided. They just don't understand the anatomy. They went the other way. They thought, okay, well, let's make it strong by thickening it up. But look what it's doing. I mean, it's blowing through several compartments. It's not fitting in any of them. I'm not sure how these tenons are supposed to survive this. Um, furthermore, so, I mean, while we're on the topic, look how far out it goes on the metacarpal. I mean, I can't imagine this MP joint will actually flex uh, at all. So there are some designs that really, I think, have no business being spanning plates. Um, so MedArtist has two plates. Uh, they solved this uh, uh, problem in strength by making it a 2-4 plate, but it is G4 titanium, the strongest titanium alloy you can possibly have. And if you're familiar with MedArtist products, uh, all their implants are like this, and you very rarely have any issue uh, with strength when it comes to their designs. They're stronger, thinner as a result of it, less, less uh, bulky. Uh, they fit into the compartments as they should. They're tapered at the ends to facilitate passing, less tendon irritation as a result of this and easier to pass, like I said. Here's a 67 year old female who fell. Uh, here we have, I think most the, um, my focus is gonna be on this uh, dorsal lunate facet. Um, I'm also gonna be a little concerned about this um, kind of volar fragment right here. How am I gonna control that with just a spanning plate? I certainly can put some uh, fragment specific fixation here, but instead what I did 
because the Met artist plate allows me to do this is I can lag that fragment into the plate and even lock it in place if I need to. Um, and so it saves me making another incision here and putting a fragment specific uh, plate on that for added security. Um, and by the way, uh, if I could just go back a second. Um, and you can see that I didn't have to do anything with the radial portion of this ligament attacks has just reduced that into a, an acceptable position there. So this plate in particular was removed seven months later, and that's a little bit crazy because we don't normally keep them in that long ever. Uh, but in this case we did because this patient fell into the COVID-19 black hole uh, where they were kind of lost to follow up and they were quarantined and couldn't get medical care or we couldn't get the surgery on. You know, I'm sure everybody's experiencing that. Um, and so they, she came back seven months later to get her plate out. We got the plate out. I mean, the radius looks good, I think. Now, but the problem is, uh, no, there's not actually, we thought there'd be a big problem with range of motion, but you can see even at the time of the removal, range of motion is not terrible. Uh, and, and it's probably gonna get better as time goes on. Uh, not as good as had the plate been removed in three months, but, um, uh, but, uh, but still, uh, I was very pleased with this. Here's a 67 year old female fell down the stairs. Uh, again, a very far distal fracture showing this is very soft bone. Um, and I think most of the uh, attention would be uh, on the lunate facet, at least in my mind. Um, and so we spanned it. Uh, to the third metacarpal, but also use quite a bit of fragment specific fixation to get those uh, pieces back where we wanted them. Uh, went back, removed the plate again, a COVID-19, a little bit later than we'd like, uh, about twice as long as we'd like. So six months later, um, uh, left the volar plate on because we didn't feel the need to take that off. It wasn't bothering the patient. And I think a uh, pretty good result here. Again, range of motion, six months as the plate comes off, not perfect, yeah, just very little motion, mostly coming from the mid carpal joint, not so much the radiocarpal joint, but we hope that is going to loosen up with physical therapy as well. 54 year old male fall from a roof. Um, you know, uh, again, this is something that, hey, you may wanna consider uh, fixing with fragment specific fixation. I don't know if this necessarily needs a spanning plate, uh, but they also, he also had this ipsilateral uh, injury to the elbow, uh, which means we're operating on both. So uh, polytrauma, you know, would be a kind of an indication to uh, span, uh, fix this quickly, make it durable so that he can uh, do what he wants to do with the arm and rehabilitate the elbow. And we do something uh, cute there that's a whole other topic to talk about later. But I do want to take a minute or two to talk about uh, Keenbox disease. I'm just looking at my time real quick. Um, this has been an interesting uh, presentation at, I believe, um, uh, one of the uh, meetings recently. Uh, it's not published yet, but there's uh, two groups, one at Duke and one at uh, uh, Bowman Gray uh, Wake Forest in uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Both are looking at uh, spanning plating as being a adjuvant treatment for Keenbox disease. And so here's an, uh, a presentation that looked at stage two and three Keenbox disease using a vascularized bone graft and a dorsal spanning plate. And what they found bottom line was that the results were pretty good. Uh, but I do wanna point out that they were pretty good compared to existing, existing literature. And the, as you know, the existing literature is not very good <laughs> for this particular problem. But in any case, uh, I did have an occasion to use it recently. I had a 22 year old female with stage 3A uh, Keenbox disease. So we have some deformity of the lunate already, but not complete collapse. You can see that there's already some beginnings of fragmentation here. And so I, I wanted to try to save this lunate. So MRI, I unfortunately don't have the MRI to show you, but it did confirm uh, avascular necrosis and uh, some non displaced fracture lines in the lunate. So here we have a uh, started with our dorsal incision and we use the um, extracapsular uh, artery off of the fourth dorsal compartment uh, as it attaches here. It's a very easy uh, and convenient um, vascularized bone graft to take for Keenbox disease. So elevating it off and then placing it right on uh, into the lunate uh, through a trough. 
Now, as we you know, explored this, we realized that the fragmentation was a bit worse than we thought. There was a very large sagittal fracture through the lunate um, that you know, arguably you can question whether we can even do a vascularized bone graft here, but we were uh, committed at that point. And so we did our best to uh, fix the lunate and also do the vascularized bone graft. So what we did is we took a headless screw from the scaphoid through the scaphoid, through the scapho lunate interval into the uh, lunate through the fracture that way. Uh, we felt that was gonna be the best way to secure uh, the, um, the small bits of the lunate. And so then we put our spanning plate uh, with appropriate tension and, and that is our uh, post-op x-ray here. And uh, we thought we were doing pretty well. She just uh, got her plate out two weeks ago and so I, I am waiting to get a CT scan to see if this lunate actually healed, what's going on, are we doing well? Uh, her pain is much better uh, for what it's worth, um, but we still, the jury's still out on what we did there. So spanning seems to be a helpful tool, at least in our hands here. And we've had uh, some experience with it over the many years. Um, you know, I'm going to just list again all these uh, indications, including King box disease. Um, but what else can it be used for? I'm sure there's other indications. They're constantly evolving. Uh, there seems to be a new indication every year. Um, whether it pans out or not, we'll see. But it's something I think you should know about. Now, I'm sure there are many critics out there. They're saying, no, thank you. We like fragment specific, excuse me, fragment specific fixation for these fracture types. Um, we're fine doing what we're doing. And that's great. And, and if it works for you, I think you should keep doing it. Uh, but I have to ask you one final question before I leave you. And so if somebody sends you this, for example, they tried an external fixator and did something here with pins, and it's an obviously a big mess. Uh, and they ask you, could you revise this, please? I'm sure there are lots, I, I can't do this. There's no way I can revise this with fragment specific fixation to any satisfactory degree. I'm sure there are people in the audience that can. And um, in fact, I know there are. And, um, but I have to ask you though, for the ones that can actually put this together, that have the time and the resources to put this together, I have to ask you if the results seem to be the same, which is kind of what we're talking about in the literature, but spanning plating is faster, easier, and less expensive. Well then, shouldn't you at least consider the possibility of trying it? And with that, I leave you that question there. Thank you very much. And I guess, uh, Adrienne, do we have any questions? Um, yes, we do. We have a few questions that came in. Thank you, Scott, for the great presentation. Um, I think that was very well explained. Um, so the first question that came in is, what is the advantage of the external fix compared to the external fixator? Oh, very good. Okay, so there are a couple things. Uh, I probably went over them too quickly. So the first thing is that obviously the obvious reason is that there's not going to be any pin site troubles. Uh, there's not going to be any pin track infections that you would get with an external fixator because there's no pin sticking out of it. Um, the second reason is satisfaction rates. I don't know if I had this on my slide, but satisfaction rates tend to be much better with the plate. People don't like frames around their wrists and things like that. So there is a subjective uh, reason as well. Mechanically though, you had the ability for this plate to buttress some fragments that you're concerned about if you need to. You also have less need for over distraction. In other words, the moment arm is shorter where less force is applied to achieve the same result. So um, these would be off the top of my head, just the, the, the simplest, easiest things. You could also keep it in longer if you need to. X fixes have an expiration date because eventually they're gonna get infected, right? So uh, if you need, you have some, um, a non-union, for example, and you're fixing a non-union and it's taken a very long time to heal, this plate can stay in a lot longer. Um, and assuming you want to do a spanning plate as opposed to some bowler plate or fragment specific fixation because it's very difficult to control, it's very distal, um, that sort of thing. So that would be a, another reason. Uh, but so these are all the reasons that I think are better than external fixation. Perfect, thank you. Um, the next question was concerning the sidewinder plate asking if this is a patient specific 
design or if it's a standard plate option. Oh, okay. Um, I assume you mean, does it come in sizes for different patients? Is that? Um, I, as I understand it, is if, it, if it's uh, made for one specific patient or if that design is available as a standard option. Oh, I see. Uh, no, med artist engineering and, and uh, a lot of surgeons involved with this did a lot of work to make it a standard um, uh, design for just about everybody. Um, and, you know, I would say that um, with the exception of extremely small uh, women or people um, where you, you might be hugging a little bit close to the EPL, you may want to just make a small incision and check and be sure that it's okay. Um, uh, but we have not had any problems with uh, using this plate on just about every size and shape uh, kind of person. Okay. And that's the question. Did I understand it correctly? I, I think so, yes. Um, and the next question is concerning the placement, um, uh, asking if at the wrist you place the plate underneath the skin or underneath the tendons. Oh, I see. Okay, so when we're passing the plate, um, now the old plates, the straight plates, you can pass either proximal to distal, distal to proximal, it really didn't matter. The med artist plates, though, are designed because they have the contours and the bends that they have, really should be passed distal to proximal. And so after you make the skin incision, you lay it on top of the bone, it, it glides down the underneath the tendons uh, on the fourth dorsal compartment. It turns, follows the radius, and still is under the tendons. You're really sliding along the bones. Okay. Um, and then uh, we have the question, if you use CT scans preoperatively. Oh yeah, well, I, you know what? Um, I don't as much as everybody else does. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, you know, I get this question a lot. <laughs> um, I don't have a lot of CTs to show like a lot of uh, academic hand surgeons because I just simply don't order them. Um, what I don't, uh, you know, I think it's an excellent way to prepare. Uh, for your plan of attack, I just tend to um, uh, fix what I need to fix. I have a plan of attack. If something else is awry, I don't feel like I've had good fixation in it. I have a good uh, distal radius set of fragment specific fixation or whatever else I'm using to address the issue intraoperatively, and I don't have as much need to do it. But no, I think I obviously, if you have the resources and the time to get CT scans, um, then by all means do so, because it can be very helpful. And the next question is, if you use, if actually the same question from two people, if you use any type of cast or, or thesis in the beginning? Oh, very good. No, uh, absolutely not. Um, so after spanning plating, they literally can start to use a walker uh, or crutches or transfer embeds lift lift you know we give them a lifting restriction of some sorts but it's a very strong thing we don't feel the need that a splint adds anything else uh, to the construct perfect um and the question from spain did you have any problems with the skin especially in elderly um i would like to follow up that question i'm not sure what they mean so we are not pulling on the skin as far as traction on the skin. We make an incision here and here. Once it's anchored to the bone, we push the plate and that plate then pulls essentially internal traction across the fracture. So the skin is not really involved with this. Now, if the question is, is the plate so bulky underneath the skin that the, the skin has a problem? Uh, I've never really had a problem with the skin, even with the bulky plates, the three, five straight plates. Uh, I've had problems with tendons moving over it and getting, okay. it, but not the skin. Um, and then the last question that we have received so far, uh, did you ever use arthroscopy during reduction and spanning plate for with the spanning plate? Hmm. Um, I think that would be a tool, whether using a spanning plate or even fragment specific plate. So I used to use, uh, you know, when I first came out of my training, I, I was, um, a big arthroscopist. And so I, I, I use arthroscopy about 30% of the time. And as time went on, um, I realized that 
I guess I'm doing okay because I'm not really, the arthroscopy is not changing what I'm doing a whole lot. And so I'm using it less and less. And so I probably maybe do it once a year at this point. Okay. Um, but the spanning plate in itself doesn't make me more or less likely to use arthroscopy as a confirmation tool. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so as of now, no other questions came in. So thank you very much, at least from my side. Wonderful. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed talking about it. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.